such an honor to be here talking to this incredible group of people and so many people in this audience should be also up here and speaking. And uh, the center is called the uh, Miyagi Center, I think, uh, Music Center. And I was thinking of the, of the Me Meiji, do you pronounce it Meiji? The three wise men uh, that came to Jesus. And um, Meiji, Meiji comes from magic. And I'm a great believer in the real magic of life and that life is magical. And every human being, uh, the last speaker who spoke so beautifully, uh, was talking about people and the importance of people. And e every human being is born to be great, um, is born with greatness. I always say genius waiting to happen. Every human being is a genius waiting to happen. And everybody's born to be a magi, a Jedi, a ninja, something great. And and that's really, I think, the internal quest for all of us is that inner greatness that we're yearning for. And to live in a world of poverty is just a world in which human beings have not found who they really are. And it's really on that topic uh, that I was asked to speak today and was going to speak about the work that we've done uh, in creating and helping create a free education movement in this country. But with this idea of the greatness of what a human being should be. So really life is all about people. And if we think about the problems in this country, uh, things like crime and violence and poverty and unemployment and lack of foreign direct investment and all of these issues, they seem so huge. And yet they're all created by people. And so they're solvable if we find people solutions. But people are complex things. Each of us knows that we're very complex. And what we learn about in school is usually just the things that we can touch and feel. You see, it's easy in science. I can just take a, a tree outside and I can cut it up and I can see that's wood and I can see the wood is carbon and I can see there's molecules and I can break up the molecules and see their atoms. I can break that up and see it's electrons and protons and neutrons. And I can go smaller and smaller and smaller. I can see quarks and bosons and leptons and I can go smaller and smaller and smaller, but ultimately, these are all things that I can break up, but yet thought, feelings, emotion, love, greatness, passion, all these things are completely intangible. I can't touch them. But are they not real? If I say to you, are your thoughts not real? Your thoughts are as real as this table is real. And yet in school, they can't teach you about that stuff because they can't touch it. They can't pull it out of your head. You can't put it under a microscope. Uh, can't stick it on the wall as a picture. And so we tend to only learn about a tiny fraction of life. And it's because we learn about a tiny fraction of life that we don't develop this full potential of who we are and we don't become the Magi and the Jedis and the ninjas and the warriors and the great human beings that we were born to be. And it's because education is not whole. So in thinking about the importance of education, which I wanted to do, and uh, Tati and uh, Kello were asking if I could speak about something called consciousness-based education, which is something I came across uh, some years ago, and I'm going to speak about that. A very unique system of education, but if one were to think, what is this thing of consciousness-based education, um, starting with this word consciousness, really, if I were just to add two words together, the importance of education, and the importance of greatness. If you could add education and greatness together, that would be the idea of consciousness-based education. Would be just any system of education that a educates a person and educates that person in a holistic way for greatness. So what do we mean by education? We mean knowledge, all the things we've learned about that other wonderful speaker, Bronwyn, um, talking about the ability to get content all over the world, um, through the use of technology, mobile phones, etc. That's very real. That's a fantastic possibility that exists. And it's part of the solution. And so that would be things like learning about accountancy or mathematics or marketing or finance or <coughs> astr astronomy or, or any other field. Knowledge is one component. Then, of course, skills. Somebody was talking about the great need that a human being must have skills and 21st century skills. 
so we have to be able to use technology, be able to learn, be quick with things, be able to make decisions, um, think clearly, work with other people, do research, etc. That's another type of thing we need. We also need a values base to be successful in the world. We need an action bias. It's one thing to have knowledge, but if you can't turn that knowledge into doing something practical, it doesn't help you. We need to be able to uplift our communities. We'll be able to have to run good families. And also we have to be happy. We have to get fulfillment uh, in our lives. So education has to incorporate this and many, many more things. Because education is that tool which makes a human being that whole thing that can master and conquer the universe. So that's really how I would think about consciousness-based education. Another way I think about it is a cat with nine lives. Many of us, um, especially boys, do naughty things when they're young, and I know we all did very naughty things, but uh, people will tell you, you know, that if you throw a cat on its head, it will land on its feet. And of course, when we were young, we all tried that type of thing. And, and, and so, on the one hand, you don't want to commit any kind of act of cruelty, but on the other side, this is fascinating. You know, you, you take a cat, you throw it upside down, and it lands on its feet. And you could do it from this chair, you could do it from the top of this building, drop the cat, and it will still land on its feet. And that's an amazing feat that a cat can do. They call it a cat with nine lives. So education should really produce a human being with nine lives or nine million lives. Because life throws us all those things all the time. We keep getting thrown on our heads and all kinds of things happen to us and happen to the world. But can we bring up young people who truly can land on their feet? So if you put them in Russia and they cannot speak Russian, could they still make it? If you put them in South America and they have to work with uh, people working in the Amazon, can they do it? If you put them in Wall Street and they have to be a trader in this crazy financial markets in the world today, can they do it? If you put them in a rural area, can they do it? So this is really what education should be able to do, is develop that great greatness in a human being. And it's just the other day thinking about this idea of the economics of greatness, because normally we don't think about greatness as something measurable because it's intangible. But what is the value of a Mahatma Gandhi to a global economy for what he did to India? What is the value of an Oliver Tambo and a Madiba and these great people to an economy? What is the value of a great citizen? It is way more than just accountancy marketing and finance, um, those are very, very important components, but just a small component. So over the last 11 years, we set out to try and create um, equal access to education in this country. We have got political freedom. We're proud of our political freedom. Many people fought for this political freedom. Many died for this political freedom. And yet we do not have anything close to an economic democracy in this country, as we know. There's huge inequality, massive inequality, 49% of our population living on $2 a day or less. And we don't have equal access to education. And you find that the people who have any little bit of a get, of, of a get ahead in life, they send their child to other schools and fancy schools. And even here in Soweto, you won't find school teachers who send their child, if they've got money, to a school here. They send them all to the other areas and, and, and so on. All the politicians' children, where do they go to school? St. Stethians, Rodin, all the best schools and so on. So we don't have an educational democracy. People don't believe in their own schools, in their own community enough to send their own child to those schools. So what happens if you don't get access to a good education, you come out and what do you do? Well, the answer is you don't do very much and the vast majority of the country coming out of the school system don't get the opportunity to do very much. And so we had worked in township schools and I'll talk about that and we came up with this idea to create free universities in this country. And we had nothing and everybody says you need something to create something and we had no building, we had no books, we had no money, we had accreditation. Um, I went to Wits University, my whole family went to universe, uh, university and you see all these fancy buildings and so on. We had none of those things, but we wanted to prove that young people in this country that we had worked with in the townships could absolutely, if they wanted to, become chartered accountants, merchant bankers, stockbrokers, anything they wanted to do. The only thing we didn't want to expose them to was actuarial science to become actuaries because uh, that's what I did. And, and that is like a lobotomy, you know, like when somebody cuts open your brain 
and uh, it takes away half your brain. That's what it's like to become an actuary, and that's what happened to me. And, and I've really never recovered. <laughs> and so, but we wanted to prove this, and people were all saying to us, no, 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 these young people can't do that stuff. Uh, they can hardly read and write properly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You should just teach them plow in the fields, fix shoes, Microsoft Office, become a secretary, things like this. And we said, that's utter nonsense. And that's what we set out to prove. And it was very, very difficult. As, any, as all of you who are social entrepreneurs know, it's not a walk in the park. Uh, walking in the park is pretty pleasant unless you get mugged. Um, and that's the kind of thing that happens to you often when you're a social entrepreneur. You get mugged on many occasions uh, in all kinds of situations. And, uh, and yet you persevere because you have a vision and you have a mission and it's deep in your heart and your soul and in every cell of your body. And that's what we set out to prove. And even though we had nothing, many, many, many miracles have happened to us. And we first built Cedar City Campus. And later on, um, two of my colleagues went to start a campus down in Cape Town called Seba. And then a friend created a campus down in Neisner called Eden. And then with Sir Richard Branson, we created a school of entrepreneurship. And um, then four years ago, we created something called the Marish Institute, which I'll talk about. And now we've just started a little campus in a rural community uh, called Meru. And where everybody said this wasn't possible, that these kids wouldn't be able to get this education, wouldn't be able to be successful, we've now got 5,500 of those young people through university or through vocational programs, diplomas, and certificates. Thank you. And these are the most amazing young leaders I've ever seen. I mean, I, I see one of them sitting in the room right here, Sydney at the back there, who's now a great entrepreneur himself. He has his own computer company. He's employing 23 staff, um, making a lot more money than I am. I have to go ask Sydney for loans. That's what social entrepreneurs do they go and lend money from all the people that they help and um, <laughs> so these students today if we look at the combined earnings of what they're earning they're earning 250 million rand in salaries rather than being unemployed um, and that's just four and a half thousand of them that we've tracked and we've got five and a half thousand out there and if they just keep working in the same jobs which they're in for the next 40 years they'll earn nine and a half billion rand so that's the power of investing in people. It is absolutely a huge thing. And over the years, it, it has been an incredible journey. We've been very, very lucky, as uh, this lady has said, you know, having great good fortune, um, being in the right place at the right time. We've met Oprah, and the Dalai Lama came to visit us on the same day as Richard Branson. Um, once we had Richard Branson listening to the Dalai Lama for two hours, um, when he walked out of the building, he was just putty. You could have asked him anything, and he would have said yes. And um, I thought, there's no way I'm going to let this billionaire out of my sight <laughs> and not fleece him. And, uh, and we did, and we did. We've got millions and millions out of him, I'm happy to say. And I think he's happy about it too. And uh, with that, we've trained thousands of young entrepreneurs in the country and just two weeks ago that Branson Center now opened up in the Caribbean um, and it's going to open up in other places in Africa. So again, who says great things don't come out of Africa? Lots of great things do. <laughs> and now we're embarking on this journey to really turn university education on its head because if I just take you through a normal university model like we all went through and uh, talk a little bit more about the kind of background and, and, and how, how it happened. But the normal university model, if, if you go to a normal university, WITS, UJ, UCT, uh, Forte, any university, you need a lot of money. You need about 20,000 Rand a year or 25,000 Rand just for tuition. Books and materials, maybe another three to 5,000 Rand a year. Accommodation and food, maybe another 20 to 50,000 Rand a year. So it might cost you about two anything between 100,000 and 200,000 Rand to go through university in this country. But then the government, which is really all of our taxpayer money, is also giving the universities about another 100 to 200,000 Rand per student, depending on faculties, etc. So it's costing about 200 to 400,000 Rand for somebody to go through university. 
And we've usually got anything between about a 30 to 50 and sometimes 70% dropout rate. So the true cost of producing a graduate in this country is about 500,000 Rand to about 2 million Rand. It's extremely expensive to produce a university graduate. But what's worse is you go to university and you do all these three years of theory. You come out, you look for a job, they say you've got no work experience. And you say, well, that's very unfair. I've just went to university and paid a fortune, and I've got a lot of debt, and I've got to pay back this debt. And then if you're lucky enough to get a job, then the company's got to spend a lot of money um, to, to actually train you up. So we said, well, can we create a different type of model of a university? Because as one of the speakers said, education's really changed. The world's changed. We should be doing things differently. So we said, combine working and learning at the same time. So you come to university, and at the same time you work, and this is what we're doing in the Marishi Institute, that we have started a call center, and we're building other businesses. So the students spend four hours a day studying and four hours a day working. So everything they, they're learning, they, they're learning in practice. They can go straight into a job, and then they earn money, and then they pay back a bursary to fund the next student, and then we don't need money from the government. So our goal within one year is to be the first university in the world with over a thousand students doing full-time university degrees, which is self-funding, the students don't have to pay money, and the university makes money and the students earn money, and they get work experience. So, so that's, that's what we're attempting to do. So I just want to talk a little bit about how this journey began and, and, and why it began. And, um, and Kello, please throw me out of here whenever it's time. So for me, it really probably started uh, two generations ago because my father, um, he, he came, his parents came from a country called Latvia, um, just next to Russia in Eastern Europe, and they escaped from persecution. They came to South Africa. They were so poor, they had absolutely nothing. They literally had the shirts on their backs, absolutely nothing. And my grandparents decided that they couldn't bring up my father. He was the oldest child. They didn't have enough money to feed him or take care of him or send him to school. They'd have to send him to a family member, and they sent him to his aunt living in the South Coast. They had come to South Africa before. So for the first eight years of his life, my father never met his parents. They were too poor, um, the family, for the family to even stay together. And then when he came back, I mean, it had a lifelong emotional impact on him, but that's not the point of the story. He was really, really, as he was going through school, thinking, how can I change the situation for my family? And he decided that the best way would be through education. And so when he was about 12, 13, 14 years old, he started to work on the railways. He worked as a lifeguard. He was a big guy, my father, with big muscles, very different to me. I'm very weedy and small. My father had a very good looking man. And so he worked as a lifeguard and so on. And he put himself, as a result of that, all the money he saved through university. And he did a first degree, and then he put his brother through university, and his sister through university, and then he did a second degree and a third degree, and he ultimately got seven degrees. The, then we got a big house, and the whole family came out of poverty, and we went to the best private schools, and so on. And then we all went to university. We all got lots of degrees, and there's 33 degrees now in my family. So, and that was caused by one person, one person who worked hard so that everyone else could get educated. And this became entrenched in my family, is that university education or higher levels of education is a way to break a family out of poverty. And we've seen this now in the lives of our students, the thousands of students we've worked with, this is what we can do. So we've educated five and a half thousand, one more minute, we want to educate a hundred thousand through university. If we can get a hundred thousand people through university, that will end up putting 650 billion rand back into the hands of families in this country. So there's no reason why any family in this country should be poor because people have the potential to be educated. We've proven again and again there's nobody who is not able to have the, if they have the right attitude, to get a great education and make it ahead in their lives. So I've, I've only got uh, one more minute. Um, there was a whole lot more I wanted to tell you about conscious-based education. One and a half minutes, thank you. That, that's very kind. <laughs> I think 
the essence of what I, I just wanted to bring out in this field is I came across, I was about to emigrate in 1995, and at that time was earning a wonderful salary. I'd been working as an actuary and a management consultant, um, earning 1.3 million rand a year, and I was ready to emigrate, and I had jobs in the States and New Zealand and Australia, and two weeks away from leaving the country, decided to stay and see if I could help to make a difference in South Africa. And it was a huge turning point in my life. And that was 16 years ago. And so for the last 16 years, I've been involved in community activism and this idea of proving that young South Africans have the potential for greatness. And one of the things that really inspired me was that in America, I came across a little school where every single year they test their kids and there's no entry requirements into the school, and the kids are just the 50th percentile of all Americans. They're just your average Joe Soap. They could work in a garage, a supermarket, they're nothing special. But this school uses this approach of consciousness-based education, which is about developing the genius of the students. And they use meditation every morning, every afternoon, something called transcendental meditation. They use yoga, they use various other methods, which if people are interested, they can talk to me about. But every single year, for 15 years now, when they test the kids on standardized nationwide tests in America, they've moved from average Joe Soap to the top 1% of all Americans. Now that is incredible. If you're an educator, you know, that's taking a computer from a Pentium 1 to a Pentium 10. And that's what a human being is. Our brains are infinite. But we're only using 5% or less of our brains because education doesn't focus on us as a whole person. And yet, when education starts to focus on the whole person, you just see the brain doing this. IQ goes like this, uh, practical intelligence, creativity, um, people don't feel stressed, they feel joy, they feel just filled with life and, and happiness. This little school that I'm talking about, it, for in the last 10 years, has won a global competition four times in 10 years, beating 450,000 kids throughout the world, and there's no entrance requirements into the school. So this is what we set out to do in Alexandra Township, where we worked with 9,000 kids, and we did nothing other than introduce meditation into those schools, bringing in this aspect of consciousness-based education. And everyone thought we were crazy. And Carter Asmal, the Minister of Education, said, if anyone can increase pass rates in a school by 5%, just 5%, it would be an act of national heroism. Well, 9,000 kids on over 100,000 school marks doing nothing other than awakening their brains, developing their full inner potential, using this methodology, increased by 25%, over 100,000 school marks. We we, we tracked 12,000 students in control schools and they dropped by a percentage point. And when we first started, we went to go talk to amazing big companies in South Africa and they said, you're joking, we don't fund funny projects like that. Bring us real projects. But when they saw these results, it went into carte blanche, it, uh, twice, it was in many newspapers and, and so on. And then we brought this into a university context. And we're still doing this in schools down in KwaZulu-Natal and elsewhere. So I just wanted to conclude then with this lovely theme of the future is inevitable. And the future is inevitable. It's going to be a great world. And we're going to make it a great world. Because we have the desire, we have the vision, we have the capability, we have the knowledge, we've got the methodologies. Between all of us, we know everything we need to solve the problems of the world. Many of them, as I've mentioned, are human created. And so when I was a little, little child growing up at school and I was this tiny little guy and you learned history and you learned about Jan van Riebeck and you learned about all these Boers and the things that people did and you learned about apartheid and all this stuff, you just thought history just is done to us. And now that I've grown a little bit, um, what I've really realized, and I think we're all realizing it as social entrepreneurs, is that history doesn't just happen to us. We make it. We create it. We can absolutely change the future. So the future is inevitable. It's going to be very bright. We should all be smiling and happy. And let's go for it. Thank you.